ahead, get in, get settled. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we just, we thank you for loving us the way you do. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to learn more about you through your word, especially this fascinating book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And Father, we come here tonight with heavy hearts with the people over there in Florida and the people in the western part of the state and beyond and everything they're dealing with. Lord, I don't think we can pray enough for that. And I pray, Father God, that you will just be with those people, that you will keep them safe, keep them uh, making wise decisions throughout this next 24 hours, Lord. And I pray, Father God, a very special prayer for the families that are so concerned about their loved ones down there. And Lord, we just ask you to let your presence be felt in a mighty and powerful way here in our study and help us to grow just a little closer to you and help us understand what it means to our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to continue our study. Now, before we get started, I'm going to remind you of a couple of things because you're going to see it play out here. There are several viewpoints and interpretations of the book of Revelation. Uh, there are many who believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation period. There are many that believe the church is going to be raptured in the middle of the tribulation period. And there's, of course, people like us who hold to the doctrine. And, you know, I think we're going to pretty much support our viewpoint that the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation period. And we're going to, like I said, highlight that again tonight. Now, with that said, there are also, as you go forward throughout the entire 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, there are going to be many verses, just simple verses that you run across, that have several interpretations for them along. And you're going to see that again tonight. Okay? Now, that's okay. It, it's not life or death. It's not heaven and hell. You know, it's the good Christian people just differ on you know, the way to interpret the Bible. Very similar to how some of us differ uh, on eternal security, uh, spiritual gifts, and, and various things. You know, it's okay. There's not going to be any, you know, any, uh, any uh, uh, special places up there in heaven for people who have various views on the book of Revelation, primarily because we won't really know for sure until we get there. Okay? We can look back on the Gospels and we can see that played out, but we can't see this because it is not taking place. Now, chapter 4... We're going to continue to open up our eyes. Now, when I say open up our eyes, you know, Revelation just grabs your attention from the very beginning, and it does not let you go, okay, until the very end. And what it screams is, you know, my faith is important. I need to be paying attention. This is serious business, okay? And here, what we're going to see is we're going to see God's holiness on display. And the theme here, well, you know, is the throne. And also, the theme here is worship, in which we're going to get into here in a moment. Now, this is one of the more straightforward chapters as far as where I'm coming from in the book of Revelation. It's easy to explain. It's pretty much easy to understand, I think. But, you know, I want to share this with you. You know, as I've stated over and over, you know, you don't get God's love without God's holiness, okay? He's, he's both. He's God is love and God is holy. Now, we're going to see his holiness here, but let me remind you that his holiness and his love intersected at the cross because sin was something that God was not going to let slide. Someone had to pay the price for the sins of humanity, and it was too great of a price for us to pay. But then again, God loved us so much that he decided to pay that price for us by sending his son. Now, Many will avoid this book, okay? I've already talked to a few people just the last couple of days, and, and they, they're very interested in the book of Revelation because the church that they go to or growing up or whatever, people, you know, they were never taught the book of Revelation, okay? Now, many avoid it because, you know, it's a difficult book to understand, as I said, but many avoid it because, you know, they think it'll go away. Well, let, I, let me, since we're talking about storms tonight, not only in what's going on in Florida, but also in this particular chapter, a storm that's getting ready to happen. Um, let me give you an analogy. It's kind of like, you know, this hurricane is coming down there in Florida. 
Now, the weatherman, he's not doing anything, but he's telling you what he sees. He's saying, look, I see this thing on the radar. It's big. It's powerful. It's going to cause a lot of destruction, and you need to do something about it, right? Now, that doesn't mean he's happy about it. He's just delivering the message. He doesn't take delight in it, okay? Now, it's pretty easy to see that that weatherman, as he, you know, all these weather people who are on the television day in, day out the last couple of days, they have an objective, right? What is their objective? They don't want to see you killed. They don't want to see bad things happen to you. They don't want to see you caught up in that storm. Well, you could apply that to the book of Revelation, okay? Jesus spent that time with the seven churches, and he was basically telling them, okay, I want you to be right when I come back. And if you don't get this particular thing right, in some cases, you're going, you know, things are not going to go well for you. Now, remember the outline. Jesus gives the outline to John in chapter 1. He says, write down what you see, write down what is, and write down what is to come. That's the outline. Well, we're getting ready to enter into what is to come phase. Now, what he sees in chapter 1 is he sees the glorified Christ. Okay? Now, what is was the spiritual condition of these seven existing churches of Asia Minor. Now, last week we wrapped up, we talked about the last three of them. We talked about the dead church, the church at Sardis. They had a reputation for being alive, but obviously they were not. Jesus saw through that. And he was not pleased with that church. He didn't really have anything good to say to them. Now, then we talked about the church of Philadelphia. Now, of all seven churches, that is the church that we should strive to be. That's the church that every church should strive to be. They were basically small and, you know, had limited resources, but they were faithful. They did the best with the resources that they had, and they were, you know, they walked through the doors that Jesus opened for them, particularly in the case of ministry. And then finally, we talked about Laodicea. Now, that's the opposite of Philadelphia. Laodicea is probably the one that best describes the condition of the church in the day and age we live in. They were lukewarm. They were that licking a promise church. They were those folks that just showed up and, you know, contributed nothing, okay? Jesus said that they made him sick. Now, remember, two of these particular churches, they thought more of themselves than they should have, which is a warning to us. You know, we've talked over the last couple of weeks how we think we got a good church, but, you know, we also remember that we said it really ultimately does not matter how we view ourselves. What really matters is how the Lord views us. Well, you see right here that the church at Sardis had a reputation for being alive. They didn't know they were dead. And the church at Laodicea, they thought they were rich. They didn't think that they needed a thing. So both of them had a false understanding of how Jesus really viewed them. In other words, they thought well of themselves, but that was unwarranted. Now, before we move forward, I was thinking about Laodicea, and I was thinking about their attitude, their lukewarm, licking a promise attitude. And we can get that, you know, I understand and then I made a statement, and I'm thinking of some of the new believers in here, and I said, you know, you've got to remember that the Bible is crystal clear that Jesus doesn't want to be added to your life. He wants to be first in your life. Now, that is a scary proposition because some of you may be saying, well, what, what does that mean? Okay, you know, basically it means, you know, it looks differently for different things. But ultimately it means when Jesus was asked, you know what the two greatest commandments in the, in the law were? He said, the first one is the greatest one, to love your father with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And the second one is very similar, love your neighbor as yourself. That sums up the law. Now, underline that part about loving your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. In other words, give him everything you got. Now, when you do that, you will be in his will for your life. And it's going to look differently on a lot of people. For example, it looked, you know, I'm in his will for my life, and it meant being a pastor for me. Well, the chances are actually very, very high that it's not what it means for you. It may mean serving on the, the homecoming committee for you. It may mean doing outreach ministry. It may be going to the nursing home. It may be any number of things on the outside of the church walls that spread the gospel message. You see what I'm saying? The point is, you know, what it means for every one of us is living out our faith on a day-to-day -day basis, seeking Him with all our hearts, and maintaining a willing heart 
in case he opens up any assignment, okay? A willing heart to any assignment he might give you. And if you have that, he's going to get you where he wants you to be, okay? That's what it means. Now, now, those letters at the end of the day, as we close out that part of uh, the book, the you know, what is part of the book, basically he's saying, you know, that we should get ourselves ready and we should keep ourselves ready because Jesus is coming back. That's effectively what he's saying. Now, if you go over here to chapter 4, verse 1, we're getting ready to leave the earthly realm and we're going to embark on a new journey, a new vision in the heavenly realm. Now, in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. That's the second part, the third part of the outline. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And, one of, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Now he sees that door open, and a voice like a trumpet. Now underline that trumpet, highlight that trumpet. He says, I will show you what must take place after this. Well, who's the voice? Well, the voice is Jesus. That's Jesus speaking to him. Now the question is, was it symbolic of the rapture of the church? Now, many will say that, you know, it was not symbolic of the rapture of the church. It was simply an invitation for John to go up to heaven and see more of what he needs to write down in these churches. But I think it was a veiled reference to the church, you know, to the rapture of the church, and primarily for two reasons, and that is because I pointed out last week the church goes offline effective in verse 1 of chapter 4. You don't see the church mentioned at all and even referred to until chapter 19 when we come back with the Lord to establish his kingdom. We're coming back. So we're somewhere. Where are we at, right? Okay. Now, remember that the first three chapters, the church is mentioned 19 times. Okay. It was all about the church. And, you know, isn't it conspicuous that now the church is not a part of the conversation? And that's because we have been raptured. I believe that is a veiled reference. Now, the other thing is that trumpet should be a red flag for us because most of the time we see Scripture regarding the rapture, we see a trumpet. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, that's another signature passage regarding the rapture of the church. Now, note that we will be changed. It means we'll get our glorified bodies. That's good news for a lot of us. Now, that's part of the sanctification process, by the way. You know, we accept Christ. We're justified. We live out a godly life and, and try to be more like Jesus. We're sanctified. And in the end, we're going to be glorified, okay, when we go to eternity. So, justified, sanctified, glorified. Now, notice that he has righteous clothes to wear. Notice that, okay? Now, basically, been glorified and rewarded. Now, John, he looks and he sees a throne. Now, who's on the throne? Well, that's pretty clear. God the Father's on the throne. He says he's in the Spirit, which means he's, in a, he's having another vision. He's not in the same vision. He's having another vision. Now, when he says he's in the vision, having a vision, his body is still on the island of Patmos, but his spirit has gone to heaven to chase after that open door. Now, he sees God the Father, like I said, and he sees something, he tries to describe him, but it's so incredible that he can't describe him in words. He just basically tries to describe his awesome presence with jasper and ruby. He's trying to describe his majesty. Now, notice the rainbows encircling the throne. Now, that's not an ark like we're used to. Now, that's symbolic for believers of God's mercy and grace. Remember when he gave it to Noah. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, here's something you need to remember. The rainbow, as we know it, always comes after the storm. 
But here is coming before the storm. What's the storm? The storm is the seven-year tribulation period. Basically, when you look at chapter 4 and chapter 5, it effectively is, or he's, the stage is being set for what's going to take place in chapter 6 when the Antichrist rides out on that first horse, that white one. Now look at the supporting cast in verse 4. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Now, 24 other thrones are up there. Who are those thrones for? Well, they're for those 24 elders, as he says. Now, notice they're dressed in white. They have crowns of gold on their head. Now, what does that tell us? Well, some look at the 24 elders, and they said, well, that's the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of uh, Israel. But that really doesn't really hold water because Israel has not been redeemed at this point. Israel is not redeemed until the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And if it's the apostles, then why is John not amongst them? Okay, he's not one of them, obviously. So that can't be what it is. But notice again, they're dressed in white. They have their crowns. So it's pretty clear when you're talking about the 24 elders, we're talking about the church. The church has been raptured. The church has been glorified. The church has been rewarded. That's us, folks. When you see those 24 elders, you are looking at us. If you're a true believer, you are looking at where we'll be when the seven-year tribulation period takes place. Now, remember chapter 3, the very last verse, if I'm not mistaken, that we covered was in verse 21 said, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, that's not the only time we see thrones. Daniel, in one of his visions, he saw thrones. In Daniel 7, 9, it says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. So we got a pretty good idea who they are, but where did they get the number of 24? Where did that come from? Well, pretty obvious it came from the Mosaic Law where 24 orders of priesthood were established for service, okay? Now, we also need to note that as believers, we are a royal priesthood of believers. Now, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, says, but you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now here's the part that really should get our attention. Notice it says, flashes of light, peals of thunder. Now, that we saw in Mount Sinai when Moses, you know, received the law. That's, we've seen that before in the Bible. But what does it mean to us? Now, if you were to look outside and you saw flashes of light, peals, and thunder, what would that say to you? The storm's coming, right? Now, that's not the only time that we're going to see this in the book of Revelation. Each time that these judgments begin to intensify, for example, after the seventh seal judgment, when they start to intensify in, in, in nature, you see in Revelation 8, 5, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire, from the altar and hurled it on the earth and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Now he's ultimately talking about judgment. That's what this represents. Judgment is on its way for sinful humanity, meaning those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Okay, not us. We're the 24 elders. Now, I always tell this story whenever I talk about this is, you know, when I was a kid on my father's side, my grandparents, who, you know, were, still have a house right across from Parker's Barbecue, whenever it started thundering, they were very, very much old school, where they would gather all of us little kids and get in a room, and they would say, Shh, be quiet, we couldn't say a word, because the Lord was doing his work, okay? That's what I think about now every time I hear lightning and thunder, okay? You know, serious stuff. Now... Notice he says, before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. There are, these are the seven spirits of God. 
Now, he doesn't say there's seven lampstands like the churches when we see in chapter 1. He says there's seven lamps, you know, basically reflecting the sevenfold character that we see in Isaiah 11 of the Holy Spirit. So another way of saying that, a short way of saying that, this is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we have the Father in the throne room of heaven. We have the redeemed church, the rapture church, us. And we have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look at verse 6, it says, Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and there were, they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Now, it says, see a glass and four living creatures, all right? Now, they're covered with eyes. First is a lion. First looks like an ox. First look, uh, the next one looks like a man. And the fourth one looks like an eagle. Now, these are cherubim. Cherubim you see throughout the Bible. Ezekiel saw something very similar when he had his vision of God, okay? Isaiah saw something very similar. Well, actually, what Isaiah saw was seraphim, which we'll get to in another time. Now, these are angels of the highest order. They are there to guard the throne. They are there to guard the holiness of God. Now, remember, they were also on each side of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. When you go all the way back to when Moses was receiving the law and instructions on how to build the tabernacle. Okay? Cherubim are a big deal in the Bible. They are a very common uh, angel in the Bible. Now, when he says eyes... That speaks to knowledge. That speaks to their alertness, their all-knowing nature. Now, the faces, here it goes as far as interpretations. They have many interpretations. Now, some say it represents God's rule over creation. Talking about the lion, he's talking about wildlife, reflecting God's majesty and power. When you're talking about the ox, you know, you're talking about domestic animals, you know, which represents faithful service. When you look at over there at man, you're talking about intelligence, which, you know, we might question that these days. And then when you see the eagle, you see all flying things, which represents supreme authority. Now, that's just one interpretation. But the one that I've always liked is that of the four Gospels. Now, you remember Matthew, he was writing his Gospel to the Jews. So when you see the lion, you're talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus. When you see Mark... He was writing his gospel to the Romans, okay? He was emphasizing service. Henceforth, we have the ox. Now, when you see Luke, he was emphasizing Jesus as the Son of Man. And then when you see John, he was emphasizing Jesus' deity. And thus, we have the eagle, which is reflective of Jesus' deity. Now, let's talk about that worship service. First of all, let's pause and see if anybody's got any thoughts on this. When you see... Uh, when you see the door open in heaven, in light of everything that I just said, what's your knee-jerk reaction? Do you think that is a reference, a veiled reference to the rapture of the church? Or do you think it's a big coincidence? And really it doesn't matter, okay, because the church is not mentioned again. So the church is raptured. The next time, a few verses down, we see the rapture church, okay, the 24 elders. What do you think? Yep, yep. Well, it gives me comfort to see that as just another verse of uh, representing the rapture of church. There are several passages that speak to the rapture of church, and I'm satisfied that, you know, that that's a proper understanding of the Bible. But, you know, I add that as just one more. Okay? Now, what about, what about the elders? Well, largely because of what they're wearing, okay? Israel, the Old Testament saints, will not be uh, redeemed, resurrected, until the end of the tribulation period, okay? So it can't be them. They're not, they've not been redeemed. We see them redeemed later. Now, so look, notice that they have crowns. That means they've been rewarded. When the church is raptured, we'll stand before the beam of seat of Christ while this is going on, 
and we will receive our rewards based on what we did or didn't do, okay? So that's part of it. They've been rewarded. Now, when they have the, the righteous clothes, the white clothes, that means they, they've been glorified, okay? So everything in the world points to the church. So I, I feel very comfortable that it's the church. It's representative of the church. It's representative. The 24 numbers, you know, most scholars believe it comes from the 24 orders of priesthood that was established in the Mosaic Law. Okay? We are a priesthood of believers. But good question. Anybody got anything else? It's yes, it's uh, it's representative of the the twenty four orders of priesthood that were established in the uh, law of Moses. Collectively, it's the church. It's representative of the church. Almost all scholars agree on that. And I'm not a scholar, by the way. I'm just you know telling you what scholars. Are. Okay, anybody got anything else? Huh? All right, let's look over there at verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sit on the throne and who forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Okay? Now notice the worshiping day and night. Talking about continual worship in heaven. Now, the three holies, many believe that that represents the Trinity. They're saying holy, first holy for the Father, second holy for the Son, third holy for the Holy Ghost, okay? Holy, holy, holy. They're all, in essence, God. But notice this. Notice this is where we can get some conversation going. Notice that the elders take their cue from the four living creatures, and whenever they begin to worship, the elders cast their crowns before the throne. Now, what are they doing when they do that? Remember, when you hear the word crowns, you hear rewards. That's their rewards. In other words, they've been before the Bema Seat. They've received their rewards. You know, what they've done, they allowed Jesus to do through them while they were on earth. And they've been rewarded. So they have those rewards in, in, a, in forms of a crown, okay? And they decided they're going to cast them at the throne. What are they trying to say? The one to be glorified. In other words, you know, now think about that. If you're in heaven, are you, you're going to feel kind of strange in the throne room of God strutting around with a crown on your head, aren't you? Okay? And that, that's not going to seem right when you know, and that's what they're acknowledging. They're acknowledging that if they did anything right for the Lord Jesus, they didn't do it in their own power. Okay? He did it. So he's the one that deserves the glory. So by casting those crowns at the throne, they are giving him glory. They're giving back to him what he is worthy of because they know they are not. Now, that tells you, you know, that there's absolutely going to be no pride, nothing but incredible humility in heaven. And I can understand why. I mean, how could any human being, you know, glorified or not, feel any sense of pride up there in the throne room with something as powerful as what we're talking about here? Now, what does that tell us about the way that we need to approach uh, pride and humility down here on earth? It says we should do everything for God's glory, does it? Okay? I mean, ultimately, it's not going, you know, the only pleasure that you can get in receiving those rewards is this pleasing to God, that you will have something to lay down before the crown. Okay? 
that you've been rewarded, you know, and that, that's what value it is to a true believer. It's not so you can get up there and say, Jesus, didn't I do good? You know, yeah, give me those crowns, yeah, and then strut around in front of the other believers. That's not what it's going to be about. It's going to be about feeling good that you allow Jesus to use you. He rewarded you so you can give him something back. You can lay those crowns at his feet. Give him more glory. Okay? That's what it's about. So what does that speak to the attitude you should have here as you're trying to store up those treasures in heaven? You should remember who you're doing it for, right? And you should also remember who's doing it through you. Because I have never done anything in my own power that was worth being rewarded. You know, have you? Okay, so that speaks volumes. Now, notice as we close, you know, notice the worship that's going on. Now, there's a couple of things. First of all, if you don't like to worship, you're not going to like heaven very much. If you don't like to be with God's people, you're not going to like heaven very much. Okay, because that's what goes on continually. Worshiping with God's people up there continually. Now, also, we get caught up in the worship style, and we have these quote-unquote worship wars here in a lot of our churches. But, you know, God's not concerned about the style of the music. God's concerned about the condition of the heart. Now, what it speaks to me is one of the things, the dangers that we have here on earth is, for example, when we're singing, you know, uh, you know sometimes we can get caught up in the entertainment value of it and forget who we're singing to. In other words, we can begin to sing for ourselves or to ourselves. Who should we be singing our songs to? We should be singing them to Jesus. Now, how do we make sure we keep that right attitude? Prayer. How about if you prepare yourself for worship and prayer before you get in there and, and remind yourself, right? Now, you know, and I'm not beating anybody up, and I can't speak to anybody's heart. I'm just saying, you know, if you have... Pastors, you know, or particularly a pastor who can preach, you know, which takes me out of it. But anyway, what I'm saying is, in, in talented musicians and talented singers, they're in more danger than anybody because if they're not careful, you know, if they're not remembering every time they get up there and being disciplined and preparing themselves to worship, they'll forget who they're singing it to. In choir, the same thing. It's wonderful to have, you know, to people to enjoy the music that you're singing. But that can't be why you're singing it. Would you all agree? You know? Beg pardon? You have to step out of the way. And it takes discipline. You know? If, if you were where you should be. If you were preparing yourself to worship. You know, but if you just walk in the door and you just, you know, like think you're going to turn it on and, and be where you need to be in your heart to please the Lord, no matter what you're doing, even if you're receiving, if you're receiving, let's, let's, let's focus on the folks that are out there receiving the songs. You know, if you're out there and how many people, you know, complain about the music, what does that tell you? That tells you that they were, they feel like they were not entertained properly. So what does that tell you about their heart? Right? The question should not be whether, you know, I got anything out of that music. The question should be, did God get anything out of that music? And if we're sitting there complaining about the music, either openly or in our hearts, then our hearts are not in a worshipful place, are they? I hope I'm making some sense. You know? That. Because you are, you're responsible, you're being held responsible for the people you're touching. Mm. So if you're not choosing the proper, if, if it's not Jesus-focused worship, then those people could be in a you know, low strategy. Of, yeah, that's right. And, 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 you know, and let's pick on pastors. I mean, there are pastors out there that can really preach. I'm going to tell you, they can preach. they got television shows. they got millions of dollars coming in there coffers you know so obviously you know uh, what's the risk that they have 
they, they are in risk of becoming prideful. And how often do we see that happen? How often do you hear about pastors that have private jets, you know, and mansions? And, you know, it's all the time, you know. Yeah, well. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's the danger is thinking that you are doing this. You know, doing it for the wrong reasons. No matter and the same is the same can be true within the body. You know, if you're doing a lot for the Lord and whatnot, then people are gonna recognize it and they're gonna pat you on the back and they're gonna praise you and that's all perfectly fine. It's good. Just don't let that get away from you. I think is the point. Yeah, lack of humility. Yeah. So, you know, that's where that spiritual audit comes into play, you know, where you're constantly, you know, asking the Lord to point out anything that, you know, you need to work on or change, not only as a church but as an individual believer, you know, constantly, you know, checking yourself and making sure you're where you need to be and being honest when he points out something to you, being in tune to the Spirit, right? Anybody got anything else? Uh oh, she's getting. I can't. I can't hardly sit down because when you think about worship, and when you think about what the Bible tells us that that we're all going to be doing, because if we're there, this is us. Mm -hmm. And if we're not preparing ourselves now to be in that state of worship, then we're doing ourselves a disservice. And so in our worship services. When we sing songs like the closing from this last week, we fall down, we lay our crown. There you go. That's what the Bible says, Mike. That's right. The, the worship, I mean, it, I, like I said, I'm about to stand up. Stand up, stand up. Ooh, say God. a couple words. <laughs> Great. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm tickled. I'm ready. I'm ready. Like right now. My biggest thing is what happened a couple of weeks ago where I felt that I messed up that song. And I, I apologized at the end of it. I even told Jane, I said, I'm sorry. But more people came up to me after that and was like, Randy Prince, which is like one of the best singers here. He's like, that's one Well, I, the Lord spoke to me one time about 15 years ago. The pastor at Sims Baptist Church started that church. He came back to our church and worshipped the last couple of years. His name was Pete Stone. He was a wonderful man. And he was a member of my church for two years, and he passed away, and he was doing the funeral. I was doing his funeral, and that church was packed, and I was in the back, and I was so nervous. And, I, you know, I just wanted to do a good job, you know, for him and the Lord and everything. At least I thought I did. And the Lord kind of spoke to me in the midst of all those nerves before I went out. He said, if you're too nervous, then, you know, this is about you and it's not about me. Okay? And, you know, and, and, you know he, just, he just spoke to me and he said, if I want you to go out there and make an absolute fool out of yourself for my glory... Are you willing to do it? And I said, well, you know, when you say it like that, Lord, I guess I am. I hope that's not what you have in mind, you know, but I guess I am. And so, you know, in other words, if it was going to be anything, he was going to do it anyway. So, so and, and I got a peace 
and I didn't do too bad of a job out there when I got that piece. So I try to remember that. You see what I'm saying? But you, if you're not aware when you walk in the building why you're there, if you know, take the time to say, I'm here to worship God, you know, you can get a lot of you in it, and you can get distracted, and, you know, and God gets shortchanged. Does that, any of this make any sense? You know, it's a discipline that you got to, you got to establish. I know I won't keep on going and hammer it. Anybody got anything else? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You won't be married in heaven. But <laughs> no, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a new body. You're gonna get a new body. All right. All right. Well, you know, this particular chapter is pretty straightforward. Uh, it is definitely about worship, and you're going to see a great big worship service break out in the next chapter just to drive the point home. And that's, uh, but if you pull out your prayer list, 